Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we are about to start our discussion on harnessing AI to detect controversies and streamline due, streamline due diligence in private investments. Um, feel free to write down any questions uh, during the presentation. Uh, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom, and we'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the webinar, where Sylvain will be happy to answer them. Um, Enjoy the session. It is my pleasure to introduce Ivan Forte, who is a CEO and co-founder of Sesam. And without further ado, I'll pass the, I'll pass the stage now to Sylvain. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge, and happy to introduce this, uh, this new series of, uh, of webinar. Um, so uh, as, as Jorge mentioned, I'm Sylvain, I'm CEO and co-founder of, uh, of Sesam. Um, I have an engineering background and I've been leading the company for around eight years now. Um, and in this webinar, what we wanted to present is how CESAM helps private equity and private debt investors uh, harness AI, in particular for ESG risk and competitive analysis. Um, so our goal for today is introduce you very briefly to the company, and then we'll dive into very practical use cases. So our goal is really to dive into actual situations with real portfolio companies that of course we have anonymized for the purpose of this webinar and where we can see how AI can help detect specific ESG controversies or positive impact events as part either of the divisions process or of the portfolio monitoring process. So we'll try to make that as concrete as possible. Let me just start with a word of introduction on CESAM and on the technology so that everyone has the context um, and knows exactly what we are doing and how we're approaching these use cases. So Sesam is a, an AI company that was founded in 2014 and that specializes in ESG and risk analytics for public, private and public markets. Uh, we're a team of around 100 people. Uh, we recently raised a Series B uh, for 35 million, and so we're continuing to grow very quickly internationally. Most of our team is based in France, in Paris, and in Metz, and we also have offices in New York, in Tunis, in London, and in Tokyo, with clients in all geographies. So what we do at CESAM is we use a technology called natural language processing, which is basically a sub-segment of AI that now people are much more familiar with, because it's everything around analysis and generation of text. And so that's basically the kind of technology that is used in ChatGPT, for example, where the system is able to understand a query and generate an answer, or in our case, generate insights, generate indicators that can help make financial decisions. Um, so just a, a sample, some of our clients that we are working with, um, as explained, we work a lot with private equity players. Uh, we work actually with seven out of the top 10 private equity firms worldwide. Um, and we also work with a, lo a lot of uh, local and international banks, asset managers, and corporates. And what we're helping them achieve is uh, leveraging AI in their processes. Teams like Carlyle or Warburg are, for example, leveraging us in order to understand whether a company at the very early stage of a due diligence is exposed to potential reputational or ESG controversy. So as to understand whether it would make sense to either move forward with the next steps of the deals and commit to a full due diligence, for example, or to stop the deal where it is in order to prevent from spending a lot of, of consulting money on that. Uh, some teams are also using us for portfolio monitoring. So we have private equity firms that are using us to track hundreds of private uh, companies that they have invested in. And we have credit teams that ask us to track thousands and thousands of assets, uh, as the credit word uh, tends to include a lot of different lines um, as, part of, uh, as part of their portfolios. So this is a sample of clients, but uh, very happy to and lucky to work with some of the big players in the space that are already leveraging AI for their own processes. So what, what, what do we do and what is the context of this AI technology that we leverage at CESAM in order to generate insights on private companies? So at CESAM, we've developed a platform called TextReal, which is our natural language processing engine. And it's composed of many different parts, but the first part is its data lake. We have a data lake of around 20 billion documents. Uh, these are news contents, uh, blog reports, NGO websites, social media discussions and the like, from which we can extract valuable insights as part of these due diligence or portfolio monitoring processes. 
in order for the data to be valuable for these AI processes, we need to make sure that it covers all of these private firms, including with local information. So we have around 4 million sources and uh, we process data in, in 100 different languages. So that means that when a due diligence process is starting, say for a company based in the US, we're able not only to extract data from US websites, but also to extract data and information related to the Chinese subsidiary of the company, or say the German subsidiary of the company in the local language with the most local information. And we archive the data in our data lake uh, with over 15 years of contents. And this is really helpful um, in private assets to get a bit of a historical trend and understand how the company has been doing over time with regards to potential reputational risk or competitive advantages. And I think that's that's very important in private equity because in private equity, private companies tend to rewrite the story a lot. Uh, so based on their latest investment uh, uh, process and how they present their story to their investors. So it's very interesting to have analytics that can uh, rationally um, uh, help us visualize how things have moved for real over the past years um, instead of relying only on uh, sims that companies are disclosing and which do embed a bit of that storytelling which is not really stable over time so from that data which tracks uh, all of these local sources and everything we're able using ai algorithms to identify the companies so we track more than 5 million companies. Uh, it's actually one of the biggest differentiators in what we do at Sesame is this ability to track so many companies. Um, most of our competitors in the ESG and reputational insight space track only public companies, so they don't cover private companies at all. So we cover a lot of companies and can add any companies on demand. And in addition to that, we then, once we are able to capture information on the company using different algorithms, recognizing the company, making sure it's the right one, corresponds to the right context, we're then able to assess various kinds of metrics on the company, such as sentiment metrics. So understanding whether contents related to a company are very positive or negative, very useful for due diligence because you can screen a company and understand over the past 15 years, has the company been exposed to negative events? making sure that nothing gets lost on page 15 of Google. And then you realize that at the end of the due diligence process, so that's really what we want to avoid. And we also track ESG metrics. It's a really big part of what we're doing. And, and our core specialty at CESAM is tracking ESG insights. So we map 90 different ESG risk categories, and we are able for any type of ESG event to understand if the company is exposed to potential controversy, how it aligns with a specific ESG regulatory framework, and what is the influence on your due diligence or portfolio monitoring process. And again, we do that for private equity and private debt. For us, it's all about tracking companies, and in some cases, even real assets and uh, 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 real estate assets, individual buildings that can also be tracked. And you'll see uh, today, most of the use cases I present are really based on our actual dashboards. So that means uh, the data can be consumed in various ways, APIs, tag files, alerts, also just email alerts when you have your portfolio and you need to make sure that it's not exposed to these controversy over time or you want to engage with companies anytime a controversy emerges. Uh, we, of course, have email alerts and notifications, but the primary way we're going to display the data today is dashboards, which are used uh, by business teams, whether these are central ESG teams, risk teams, or deal teams in private equity. These are our typical users uh, in the space. All right, so now that you have a bit of context on, on the technology and on, on what we do, um, I'll dive into the, the, the different use cases. Um, one thing I just wanted to hint at, we're not gonna cover that too much uh, today, but you should know that this part algorithms involve a lot of stuff around large language models and the like, and we're actually going to uh, organize a follow-up session on that uh, in the next few months. Uh, so stay tuned, and you're going to hear a lot more about generative AI in that specific context in the next few months. All right, so let's, let's dive into the use cases. So what we wanted to show you is um, three different tangible use cases where we're going to analyze individual companies um, in different dimensions. So we're going to look at ESG controversies. 
So that specific uh, use case is a private equity firm is doing an initial due diligence, want to make sure that the company fits with their ESG strategy, or a private equity or private credit firm is looking to track their portfolio of assets in real time and wants to make sure that they can control these controversies and react as quickly as possible. So these are negative events. There are regulatory aspects to that. These are typical for Article 8 funds where there is a need to um, monitor uh, the fact that the companies do no significant harm. So there's even a regulatory aspect to that. And these are all about negative events and risk. The second topic is that we're going to cover is sustainable development goals in the context of positive impact. And so in that case, our objective is to identify positive events on companies using AI and understanding how they could impact the sustainability roadmap of the company, using that to engage with the companies, using that also to prevent from harmful communication that would be borderline greenwashing. So that, that also happens and it's good for investors to really educate the company on what's feasible and what's not feasible in ESG, making sure that they don't go too far in terms of the claims. That's going to be really focused on positive impact. And lastly, we're going to focus on a few examples purely on due diligence and adverse media. So things like I have a company entering my pipe. I need to make sure that there are no major risks occurring. Um, and I want to do that in just a few seconds. And so that's that's one thing that we need. Let me just uh, highlight a, a few of the things that are where we think that AI is really valuable and that NLP technologies can help private equity investors and the reasons why we see this adoption. The, the first thing is um, AI allows to, to monitor companies systematically without human intervention. And this is really huge in private equity because it gives the type of systematic coverage that you would get from a rating agency, typically an ESG rating agency like MSCI or System Analytics, but you get that on assets that these rating agencies will never ever track because their processes are based on manual work and endless and committees and assessment. Using AI, we can bridge the gap between public and private assets. And that gap is primarily coverage of data, having the ability to screen the many, many, many private companies that exist in the world. Um, in order to do that, of course, we need advanced algorithms because it needs to reach human precision. Otherwise, we rapidly get noisy insights and the like. At CESAM, when we detect, for example, ESG controversies, uh, the level, when we compare that to manually extracted controversies done by some of our ESG analyst experts partners, um, we get 98% of accuracy. And so our insights are almost exactly the same as what we would get with um, manual insights. So we're able really to compare with a statistical view, what we get in one case and in the other. And the, the last thing that I wanted to highlight is AI is often kind of accused of being a black box and everything, but the great thing about NLP is that it's text. And so every single numerical insight that we're gonna extract saying, this company is in a high risk situation, this company has a high level of ESG controversy, it's all based on text data. So we can go back to the individual article and I'll show you some example and we can read it and we can analyze it and we can interpret it in a way that is really, really easy and transparent. And for us at them, it's very important. This is also why we license um, tens of thousands of premium source of data um, and where we give access to them to our clients directly. So that means that even if that source is under paywall, you can still get it, click on it, get access to the information and make sure that you're not just looking at the insights and potentially lacking some information, but that you can dive into the individual underlying company. All right, so we're, we're gonna start with the first part, the ESG controversy part, and now we dive into actual use cases. So let me start with an example with one of our large clients in uh, Europe. So this is a view of our ESG controversy monitoring system. And the typical use case here is a private equity firm that has a number of existing portfolio companies or private credits uh, with existing loans. Say they have between 20 and 300 different companies that they invest in, depending on their side. And they want to make sure that they are not missing any ESG controversies. 
Um, if it's an Article 8 fund, this is mandatory. Um, if it's not an Article 8 fund, just to make sure that they can report on that information and that they can quickly interact with the company if any of these critical issues occur. So portfolio monitoring use case with a focus on ESG risk. And so the company that we're looking at here is a gaming company. So it's an actual company that we are constantly monitoring and that we've had specific engagement with. And uh, you've seen that we've anonymized all of the contents, et cetera, but we made sure to include sufficient information for you to understand uh, the logic. So in that use case, what you can see is that we have individual events, such as uh, one of the former employees of the companies being jailed for sexual assault on a schoolgirl, for example, or a complaint by one of the investors or specific violations by the companies. And you see that each of these events is uh, automatically associated with a specific ESG category by the AI system in accordance with regulatory framework. So in that case, it's associated with governance issue and there are sub risk categories related to corruption or to crime, for example, and uh, these are tagged automatically. We also compute the sentiment for each of these events. So in that case, as you can imagine, these are primarily negative events. And we then have a proprietary score called the intensity score on a scale from zero to five which is basically an assessment of the materiality of the event. How likely is this event to have a very negative influence on the company's brand and financial, and how likely it is to have an influence also on its community or on the environment based on these concepts of double materiality. You see also the date of these articles, they are generated on a daily basis, but the real focus of our platform is on quality of content. So you're, you're not gonna find thousands and thousands of contents, even for a company here that is exposed to consumer insight, it's going to be narrowed down to the actual contents that are controversial and that are very high quality and that are severe, that are really problematic for the company and where there is a need to act. So in addition to that, you see on the, the top of the screen, uh, you see this time series analysis so where we see these bar charts. Uh, with the level of intensity of the controversies over time. So these are really helpful to understand for a company if the event is in line with day-to-day -day noise basically on the company, because say it's a company exposed to the public eye a lot, or if it's an abnormal event. And um, we've been working with a lot of private equity firms that tell us there are some companies where there's just constant noise and the difficulty is to understand what is a real controversy what is likely to have an influence and what is something that we shouldn't care too much about and where we should just report on that information, but not necessarily act and uh, engage in a specific uh, discussion with the company. So these types of charts are really helpful for that because you can differentiate between what's high risk and what's low risk. Um, and also you get these types of scores. So you see here the governance score on the company is uh, re governance risk uh, on the company is relatively high. And you can benchmark this uh, uh, either with public or private companies benchmarks. So that helps you understand more in the due diligence phase if that company is doing well from an ESG risk perspective, if it's well positioned in the market, and if therefore it could have a sort of competitive advantage on the ESG side, or if potentially it's not well positioned. And I find that, I find that really interesting in some segments that are controversial. Um, think oil and gas, for example, uh, with regards to environmental issues. So oil and gas overall will have a negative environmental risk score, and it's logical due to the nature of the industry. But it's interesting for some of our, some of our investors that are exposed to these, uh, to these uh, energy companies to understand which are the companies that actually have sustainable actions in place and that are going in the right direction and that are basically doing better than their PO group. So these scores are really, really helpful for that. And so for that specific company, uh, we track these controversies all the time. So at any time one of these events occurs, the investors is automatically informed of that information. The company itself is also oftentimes in the loop. So sometimes they, they, they get direct access to our dashboards and our data, and they can receive the information on themselves, and they can also react to the event. So there's really a value to having the company and the investor linked in that process and thinking together about how to address the controversies. 
and you can see that it's possible to get access to the underlying content. So that specific um, article I was mentioning, an event I was mentioning about uh, the sexual assault, um, you can see here a portion of the content and we have the full article inside our platform. So that would also be uh, transferred uh, via email to the investor and to the portfolio company in that case. So that, that's one of our most common use cases. It's very easy to implement. And you can see that on specific portfolios of private companies, it works very well to help uh, detect what is a real controversial event in line with ESG regulatory frameworks, and then to give access to underlying analytics, uh, which are useful for all retailers. All right, so let, let's have a look to another company. Uh, sorry, I look at another company. This one is a data company, and uh, the company was uh, listed now, so it was private and was uh, uh, made public by the private equity investor. And so in that case, the, the company is exposed more to legal issues and data privacy issues. So we have the same type of dashboard. One thing that is interesting here is that the level of controversy on the company has rather increased recently. So you see spikes of data from March 2023. So this is really a live situation uh, that is evolving. And you can see that the controversy revolves around two things, uh, an investigation on the company linked to deceptive communication and uh, things related to uh, consumer protection laws around data privacy uh, specifically. And so which is tagged both as data privacy and anti-competitive practices. So again, the events are identified with the system, properly tagged, and you can get these specific analytics here. And so uh, this is also an illustration of the ability to track this over time and in every situation, including in that case where the, where the company was made public uh, after uh, being acquired by the private equity firm. Um, so a bit of a slightly different situation there. One thing that I also want to highlight is that not all events are equal for all companies. Um, so we also map the different sectors of the companies um, in order to understand whether a specific type of event may be more impactful in one specific case. So if you have a company that is handling a lot of consumer data, say a B2C technology company, like a Dropbox, for example, Trello, or, or another similar company, it is likely that data privacy events are going to be much more critical uh, than in, uh, in companies that are, say, uh, working on industrials, for example. Um, and, and so this is also part of our materiality assessment. And I think this example is, is interesting as events related to data privacy tend to be ranked higher for that specific company due to the nature of its activity. So again, I'm not, not gonna share too much information on what these companies are, but I can tell you these are all existing private companies in the portfolio of our clients. Uh, and so these are real life uh, use cases as you can see. There's one last one that I wanted to, to show you with that ESG controversy analysis. So it's a slightly different uh, use case, but it's more about how can we use this to predict the future? Like how can we predict if a company may be potentially more exposed to controversies in the future and therefore as part of a decisions process, should we really make an investment in that company? And so here I took a very publicly critical company that is Binance. So Binance as you know, as a um, cryptocurrency exchange company uh, that has been controversial in the past. And uh, that is actually an investment of a lot of venture capital and private equity firms, and also has a lot of links with banks, uh, including several loans, which are relatively significant. And Binance uh, has been recently sued along with its CEO by the SEC. And for, um, for a crypto exchange, that is one of the worst things that could happen. Um, it has immediate and enormous impact on their activity. It tends to lead to situations similar to bank runs. And in addition to that, uh, the regulator has the power potentially to really shut down the company entirely. And um, all of this could also have a lot of impact on their uh, private debt uh, as a company. So what we find really interesting for Binance is it's a typical situation that we see a lot where there is an accumulation of controversies over time. 
So as you can see on this chart from December 2021 to early 2023, the company has been exposed to not only more and more controversies, but to controversies of higher and higher intensity over time. So you see the, the proportion of these red and yellow bars is increasing over time versus uh, the green bars uh, for the company. And so these yellow and uh, red uh, portions correspond specifically to intense controversies ranked as three, four, and five out of five. So you can see really that like in public markets, in private markets, there is in many cases related to these risks, a sort of momentum effect where once uh, there are events triggered and an accumulation of controversies, we tend to see this situation deteriorating even more and snowball. And we see that really, really often on a lot of situations. And the goal here is really to talk about private assets, but we've seen that also here on companies such as Signature Bank or SVB, where you can see that accumulation of controversy over time and ultimately the event that is really critical, and in that case, the regulatory event. So slightly different company, uh, and in that case, one that, uh, as you can imagine, we can, we can showcase publicly, but we found it interesting to not only focus on the individual event monitoring aspect, but also on how this could be used as an early warning and as a predictive system. And many of our clients that have a data science team are doing predictive analytics and looking at how these analytics are um, helping them predict whether a deal will go right or whether it will go wrong. All right, so we dive pretty deep into that first part that is on um, ESG controversies monitoring on individual companies. One thing that I wanted to highlight now is the also the ability to do that on a full portfolio. So again, here we look at real clients, we merge some of their assets with uh, other assets of um, some of our French clients. So you can see here a lot of different assets from listed companies to private companies to individual cities, so typically debt, uh, et cetera. So from Al uh, Alliance, for example, to the Com Commune de Lyon, for example. And so all of these are ranked inside a portfolio and it's possible to really benchmark your entire portfolio uh, with regards to these controversy levels and to understand where you should prioritize analysis. So for example, Alliance, uh, Orange, Artemis, and uh, Group Auchan have been significantly exposed to controversy in the past few years. And the team for that specific client uh, is interested in using that ranking in order, in order to engage as a priority with these specific portfolio lines and make sure that they don't miss uh, these controversies. So it's a different type of view, one that aggregates all lines of the portfolio. And as you can see, it's also possible to understand statistically what are the main events on a client portfolio. So in that case, the portfolio is mostly exposed to fraud, embezzlement and crime issues followed by employee relationship issues. So this is also a French companies. And so there is a tendency to have more of these social issues in Europe compared to the United States. Um, and so we can see that pretty clearly in that portfolio with a large portion of employee relation topics. So these are different kinds of view, all of them available in our dashboards and from which our uh, clients can view individual assets, perform their portfolio monitoring tasks, do their due diligence, and also just have a global view of their portfolio in real time. Well, one, one thing also that I wanted to highlight is it's, it can be seen as easy to, say, have a day-to-day -day management of a portfolio of 50 lines, for example. So sometimes we have deal teams telling us we know our assets very well uh, because we're very close to them and our portfolio is very concentrated. But the reality is when it, it comes to web data, even the companies themselves do not necessarily have all of that information. So um, even them are even these companies are not necessarily aware of the controversy that is emerging in one of their subsidiaries in Australia, for example, or in China. So we can get these insights. And the second thing is that there is a real benefit to having that in real time, not waiting for the quarterly report of the company and for that, for that information to be reported by management, which by itself creates its own biases if it's a governance issue. So with the SEDAM data, we provide this on a daily basis. I think that's also a benefit of AI is being fast, being really able to perform this systematic analysis, uh, analysis almost in real time. 
Right, so now we, we went over all of the use case related to ESG controversies, individual assets and portfolio. Let me dive into uh, also the positive impact side. So ESG is not all about risk. It's also about monitoring the sustainability roadmap of your portfolio companies. And um, it's also about making sure that they communicate in a way that is in line with regulatory frameworks, being able to report to uh, um, external shareholders and stakeholders, including LPs, uh, how these companies are aligned, especially with sustainable development goals. And that is also one thing that we can achieve with AI on the data. We can pick every single event and analyze every single event that is linked to one of the sustainable development goals. So in that case, for example, on climate action, and we can use that in order to um, rank these events, score these events, and create scorecards for each individual companies and also potentially uh, um, compare these companies to their peers or to industry benchmarks. So here I took an example, so typically a, um, a European example with SMCP. So looking at um, a clothing brands such as Sandro and or Maget, for example. Um, uh, again, these are actual client use cases. And so for SMCP, uh, we have, for example, a specific event related to Goal 13 climate action where they have uh, uh, recently hired a head of sustainable development, formerly head of sustainable development at, at Galerie Lafayette. So um, a profile uh, that will help them on their sustainability roadmap. And this is automatically categorized and has an impact on their climate action um, uh, scorecard. So yeah, we, we typically package this with, with our uh, ESG alerting offering. And when portfolio companies receive that information, they find it also interesting to not only focus on risk and regulation and the negative impacts of ESG, but also to see how they are perceived from a sustainability perspective uh, by the media, by consumers, and understand how the actions that they are putting in place have an impact on their perception. So again, hopefully really practical use case, focusing on a real company uh, and looking at how they are perceived from a sustainability perspective. Thank you, Silman, for the insightful presentation. Uh, now we're going to move to the Q&A session. Uh, please uh, feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we'll address as many as we can. Uh, at this point, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Here's the first one. Uh, how accurate is AI to detect controversies in small companies? How common are false positives? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, so our priority as a company is uh, data quality. So we have so much data that is even more important to uh, filter out ir irrelevant insights, um, including when we work on like social media, et cetera, from which these controversies can emerge. Uh, we put a lot of focus on that. And so what we do is our intensity score that you see on, on, on the screen, uh, on this one, for example, um, this intensity score is really a combination of many parameters that help us find the events that are, that are most relevant. So we need the event to be actually negative. We need to, it to be actually about the right company. We need it to be actually about a severe ESG event in the right context of analysis. And so it, it is in this way that we um, avoid false positives. I really want to highlight that we, we have a systematic and statistical approach to that. And so what that means is that we benchmark our analytics against human annotation. And I was mentioning that for critical controversies, our accuracy is 98%. So it's very, very high. We really avoid false positives. We don't spam users, things like that. So if, if anyone has things like Google alerts, I, I think you know the pain of having too much information. That, that's really not what it is. Excellent. Thank you, Sivan. Uh, here's another question. Uh, do you have any uh, geographic uh, focus or language uh, focus? Um, so our data is quite universal, actually, um, and it's pretty unique in the industry. Uh, so we cover many different languages, including uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, for example, uh, including Spanish, Portuguese. Um, and you should know that our data is only 40% English, and then 60% of that they lick is non-English languages. So one of our specialties is 
our ability to track small firms and to track there everywhere at once, and also to track firms that are not just on the radar of large US private equity companies, but also uh, where we work uh, with small uh, or mid-market private equity firms in France or in other countries in Europe. Excellent, thank you, Sivan. Uh, those are all the questions we have. I think we can wrap up. So thank you all for your participation in today's webinar and special thanks to Sivan for the uh, engaging presentation. We really hope this was a valuable uh, presentation for all of you. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Sesam, please visit sesam.com. Uh, you'll find you'll find a lot of resources there to further your understanding of the intersection between AI and private investments. Um, for those who would like to revisit the webinar or share it with colleagues, we'll be sending out the recording of the session soon. So keep an eye uh, on your emails for that. Thank you uh, once again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at further webinars. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Have a great day.